Okay, thanks so much. As mentioned, my name is Kim Hazelwood from Facebook AI Research. There I work with an, an amazing set of engineers, scientists, researchers who are passionate about the intersection between systems and machine learning. And today, on behalf of the entire team, I want to talk to you about an often overlooked space within machine learning and systems. First, let's take a look at how we got here. Uh, over the past 20 years, we have seen a fairly significant increase in investment in deep learning. Now, a lot of that has come from fairly significant advances, algorithmic advances uh, that have really driven uh, new use cases. Now, a lot of those algorithmic advances have been empowered by fairly fundamental breakthroughs at the systems layer, be it hardware, software systems. And then on top of that, we now have access to significant amounts of data, uh, better quality data, as well as the tools needed to be able to aggregate and procure that data. So now let's also take a look at the end-to-end -end machine learning execution flow. So we essentially have three stages of the machine learning pipeline. We have the data stage, we have tr training, and then we have inference. In the data stage, we're taking unstructured data and uh, structuring it into features. In the training stage, we're taking those features and determining how much do we care about any given feature uh, and building out better models. Once we're happy with the model, we may deploy that out into production or to users. And that in and of itself produces additional data that we can use to um, advance the, the models that we've developed um, continuing the cycle. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about each of those three stages and the scale at which we're, we're uh, facing each of these stages at Facebook. So first, let's take a look at data. So if we look at over the past year, uh, the amount of data from our data warehouse that is uh, feeding ML models, that went from 30% of all data uh, driving machine learning models up to the current state of 50% of all data. And then on top of that, the amount of data that we've had doubles every year. So over a one year span, if you're doing the math, this ends up being a 3x increase in the amount of uh, data that we're using for machine learning over a single year. Now, if we take a look at training, uh, first let's look at uh, people. So the number of engineers who are training models as their day job each and every day uh, has doubled over a 12 month span. The amount of models that they're training has uh, increased by 5x over that same time duration. And then the amount of computational capability needed to be able to power all of that machine learning training has increased by 8x over a one year span. And then how about inference? So each and every day at Facebook across all the family of products, we're doing hundreds of trillions of predictions um, across all products. These may uh, be uh, translations from uh, dozens of language pairs to other language pairs. Uh, they may be uh, detecting objectionable content and removing um, hate speech from our platform or detecting fraudulent accounts, uh, which, we, which our automated systems do each and every day, catching millions of, of uh, fake accounts. So now let's talk about the machine learning models that power all of that, um, all of our products. Uh, many people have a fairly simplified view of the world when it comes to machine learning where uh, the focus is either on computer vision or natural language processing. So we get a lot of questions along the lines of, uh, do you care more about CNNs or RNNs? But the reality is that at Facebook, the picture is much more diverse and we have a wide variety of models in use, some of them not even in the category of deep learning. And um, in fact, if you look across all of the various use cases, we have a pretty uh, heavy focus on MLP uh, across all of our uh, ranking and recommendation products. So it's that recommendation space that I want to talk to you about today. 
So what are we using recommendation for? Well, we're using it for all sorts of uh, use cases. If you take a look at the your Facebook news feed, we're using recommendation to determine from the thousands of candidate stories we could have showed you, which ones are you most likely to like and engage with. Uh, when it comes to uh, stories, which is across many of our products, uh, we have lots of options that we could have shown you. How do we choose which ones are, are you most likely to like? And then Instagram itself, if you're searching, knowing what kinds of images you like to see, um, we're, this is all powered by recommendation systems. So let's talk about the compute footprint that is powering all of those systems. So if you look across uh, all training at Facebook, over half of it is uh, training recommendation models. And then if you look at the deployed models we have in production, over 80% of our computational resources are being spent uh, making predictions uh, for recommendation systems. Meanwhile, if we take a look at the research community, you'll see a fairly different picture. So what we did was looked at the top system conferences for the past five years and took a look at what kinds, what areas of ML were they focusing on, where, what were they designing systems for. And there we were, uh, we noticed that um, computer vision really took a case. So most people were working on developing systems to recognize cats and dogs. Uh, over 82% of publications were focusing on that. We saw 16% of publications were focusing on natural language processing. And then a mere 2% were focusing on recommendation systems. So what's going on? Why is there such a disconnect between what is happening in reality and in production and what researchers are focusing on in, in the community. Now, before we uncover that, first let's sort of run through what, is, what are recommendation systems doing from a high level. So if you think about the scale at which we're dealing with recommendation systems, we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of items that we're trying to decide uh, how to rank uh, in order to make a prediction about what should be the item that we show a given user. So we start from, hundreds of thousands of candidate items. We're sending it through a neural recommendation model, which has billions of parameters. We're then coming up with this uh, ranked list. And then uh, that list is going out to users and the scale of users at Facebook is in the billions. Let's take a step uh, down and take a look at how do those recommendation models work from an algorithmic standpoint. So the thing to know about recommendation systems is they're leveraging two different types of features. They're leveraging dense and sparse features. Dense features for all of the continuous information that we have and sparse features for all of the categor categorical features. And uh, the way to think about uh, continuous features is these are, feature these are questions that have a concrete answer and then categorical uh, and sparse features are a vast number of yes or no questions about the user or about the items that we're trying to um, uh, recommend. So the way we uh, represent the continuous features, we send those through a dense DNN uh, NLP like you're, you're expecting. When it comes to the categorical sparse features, there we're leveraging embedding tables. And this is just a representation of all of the sparse data. We then need to take those two different components and uh, integrate and combine them into a singular uh, DNN. And coming out of that singular DNN then is a set of predictions across uh, for each individual item, what is the likelihood uh, that the user will like this? And um, then we can form a ranked list from that. And this allows us to come up with a uh, recommendation for what the user might like and um, recommend a book or an uh, article of clothing or a photo. So when it comes to um, evaluating uh, those recommendation models, there's a couple things we need to keep in mind. So number one is it's widely known that ranking more items leads to better recommendations. Uh, therefore, from a systems perspective, what we want to focus on is very high throughput. 
We want to be able to evaluate lots of different candidate items all at once. At the same time, there's a user waiting on the other end for that recommendation. Therefore, we have a pretty firm uh, latency requirement uh, so that they're not left waiting for that recommendation um, to the point where they don't care anymore. So the way we evaluate and the, the way we optimize our systems is that we're focusing on latency bounded throughput. Now, when it comes to how those recommendation systems are hitting the hardware or hitting the underlying systems, it turns out there's some fairly unique challenges when you focus on recommendation systems. So I'm gonna talk about three of those challenges. First, I'm gonna talk about the embedding tables themselves and the stress that that uh, introduces into the system. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about how the recommendation models themselves um, have a wide uh, variety of features of um, axes that they will vary and how they uh, execute on the underlying hardware will uh, vary, the performance will vary depending on uh, the features of the, the specific model. And so I'm gonna talk about each of these uh, systems challenges in turn. So first let's take a look at the embeddings themselves. So the embeddings are very large. Um, so these are orders of magnitude larger than anything we're used to seeing if we're focusing on CNNs, RNNs, or fully connected layers. So there we have to deal with um, pretty significant challenges to our storage hierarchy and um, how we optimize for that. On top of that, because we're dealing with sparse data, uh, the computational intensity is actually quite low. Uh, it's a lot of zeros. It's not particularly computationally intensive to multiply lots of different numbers by zeros. So the overall flops per byte is significantly lower on, for embeddings than we're used to seeing in CNNs and RNNs. And then finally, because the, the data is so sparse, the access patterns throughout memory are going to also be very irregular. And this is uh, pretty challenging uh, to deal with from a systems perspective. Next, if you take a look at the models themselves. So if we took a look at three different recommendation models that are in use at Facebook, and it turned out those recommendation models varied significantly in uh, some of the fundamental traits that they had. So the, across the three recommendation models, you would have fully connected layer sizes varying significantly. You had uh, the number of embedding tables would vary, the size of those embedding tables, how often we're accessing those embedding tables would vary significantly across three different recommendation models. Then if we start to take a look at the bottlenecks that get introduced by each of these recommendation models and hone in on the specific operators that uh, where all of the time is being spent, that also was varying across different recommendation models to where you can't even just go in and optimize for a, a very important operator uh, because that's gonna be different between the different uh, recommendation models. And a lot of that had to do with some of the characteristics of how the recommendation systems were set up. And then finally, uh, there, the sensitivity of those uh, models uh, when it came to how they would perform on the underlying systems, this also would vary. And it was very sensitive to uh, any minor change we would make, like batch sizes would uh, swing which hardware system was uh, better optimized for that particular model. Therefore, it, it's extremely important that both the model itself and the underlying system are co-designed, designed together so that we, you uh, can optimize for the specific bottlenecks that are going to come into play and that you uh, define your batch sizes according to what the underlying system um, uh, prefers. Okay, so let's go back to my earlier point about what's going on in the research community. Why is everybody writing papers about um, recognizing cats and dogs when we have a fairly important problem on our hands 
on how to design systems for uh, recommendation models. And I've already outlined a, a long series of challenges that need to be solved in that domain. So if you think back to what's different about uh, computer vision and NLP domains, you'll get a little bit of a clue if you take a look at how they were able to evaluate any new ideas that they had. So it turns out one of the key enablers to doing research is having an agreed upon standard set of workloads and data sets that everyone can agree upon and can optimize for. And in the CV and NLP communities, we had those, but in the recommendation world, recommendation is extremely sensitive to the data set. And a lot of the data sets are proprietary. So this made it extremely challenging to even work in the space. So it's not that the researchers didn't think it was an important problem. It, it was that they didn't have the, the tools, techniques, and data that they needed. So that's why I'm excited to talk about DLRM. Uh, a year ago, Facebook released uh, DLRM. This is the deep learning recommendation model. What this is, is a configurable model where you can change lots of different parameters about the type of recommendation that you're trying to do. The ratio of dense to sparse features, the widths and depths of your DNNs. All of these can be varied so that you can get a good sense of how sensitive are your systems to the types of uh, variables that will change across recommendation models. And so that has been open sourced. It's uh, available on GitHub. And then on top of that, uh, there's also a uh, industry-wide effort to standardize uh, the workloads and the data sets needed to be able to evaluate systems uh, in the ML community. And that effort is called MLPerf. This is a, a um, fairly uh, widespread effort across uh, nearly 50 companies um, and dozens of universities. And the latest release of MLPerf includes the DLRM benchmark, and it also includes a non-proprietary data set, ads data set that can drive uh, the uh, DLRM model. So now we have all of the ingredients that we need to be able to uh, kickstart research and um, advances in the recommendation community. So hopefully throughout this talk, I have convinced you that recommendation systems are important. Um, it's over 80% of what the computational cycles at Facebook are used for. Also, they're underinvested. Uh, only 2% of the recent publications coming out of the systems community were focusing on recommendation systems. And at the same time, they have a set of unique challenges, lots of problems that need to be solved and so that's why it's very important that uh, we're remedying this underinvestment and that we have more people working in the space. And to be able to enable that, we are excited that now there are standardized benchmarks, workloads, and data sets available for the community to be able to leverage. Okay, so thank you so much for your time. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, feel free to check out the Facebook research website where we have lots of publications. The, uh, you can download the DLRM um, recommendation model uh, from GitHub and you can um, contribute to MLPerf or uh, like compete in the MLPerf competitions. Thanks so much.